Good morning. Thanks for having me back. Uh, it's a big deal that you let me come back. So uh, I appreciate it. It's good to be together uh, this morning, worshiping God and, and spending time together in his word. What a joy that is always. Uh, and so I do look forward to going through one of the Beatitudes with you. Uh, Matthew 5, verse 6 is where we're going to be today, diving into your word. Uh, I will say uh, greetings from Miller as well. We're excited for this coming year. It's interesting in summertime sometimes, but now we're really ramping up. It feels like August just started, and in my mind, August is basically already done. Because there's just all this stuff. You know how it is sometimes. Uh, and it's right around the corner that we're going to start, and we're thankful for how you pray for uh, and care for the school. Uh, we are very grateful and excited for what God's going to do this year. So we are in Matthew chapter 5, uh, and you've been working through the Beatitudes, and now I'm coming in in the middle of something, so in some ways I have no idea what you've talked about. I, I mean, I have an idea, because I can read scripture here, but I don't know what all things you've gone into, so if we go over some of the same stuff again, bear with me. God uses repetition in his word for a reason, uh, that it sticks in our minds. So just trust that anything that I say that you're like, oh, someone already talked about that better than Daniel is a couple weeks ago, uh, have grace with me, right? And realize, ah, this would be a good thing for me to hear again uh, and know. But we're going to just work through this one verse, kind of jump around scripture a little bit, talk about a couple different concepts in there uh, that we see Jesus emphasizing as he is in his ministry, which he does all the time. Jesus is a great teacher. Uh, he's known for that, and we even see at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7 where they look at awe, Jesus with awe because of the authority with which he spoke, because of how he expressed truth to the people and they could understand it, and they could see that Jesus wasn't coming as any of the other teachers, but with more authority than them, uh, calling his authority equal with that of Scripture itself because he's God. And so there is great truth for us to have in the Beatitudes and actually, the Beatitudes, more than almost anything else that we have in Christianity, has caught the attention not just of us as followers of Jesus, but of the world. If you look at other many, many other major world religions, much of what they teach is taken from places like the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount and what Jesus had to teach. Things that they espouse as central to how we should live our lives are not made by man, but were made by God. And were given to us by Jesus in these truths. And so it is a wonderful place for us to explore, to understand who God is, what that means for our lives, uh, and how we should live in a world that is contrary uh, to what God created it to be in many ways and looks different. And so it is with that kind of joy that we get to enter into uh, Matthew 5, verse 6, where it says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Right? Jesus is in front of a large crowd that is gathered. Um, well, I was just, sometimes I have to remember I'm not in the classroom. Although you guys are pretty, um, ask questions here, which I like, because I was about to ask a question back. Who remembers what was happening right before the Sermon on the Mount? Uh, but sometimes that's not fair to just ask you that, because I haven't been going through class together. But if you go to the end of chapter 4, we see Jesus' ministry actually beginning. So there's been the first chapters of Matthew talking about the birth of Jesus and those things that have gone on um, and some of his childhood uh, and this process that Jesus was going through and becoming prepared for what God had in store for him. He's baptized, he goes to the wilderness, and he's tempted in the wilderness. And then Jesus began to go all over Galilee. That's what it says in 4 verse 23 teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Then the news about him spread throughout Syria. So they brought to him all those who were afflicted, those suffering from various diseases and intense pains, and demon-possessed, the epileptics and the paralytics, and he healed them. And large crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So there's this large crowd that flocked to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus came and began to tell them the good news of the kingdom. And this actually becomes the main thrust, not just of the Beatitudes, although certainly we see it, and maybe you talked about this, but verses 3, the first Beatitude, and 10, the last one, show us what is the heart of the Beatitudes, and it's this kingdom of heaven. Because blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? For they will 
inherit the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. They become bookends, but we also see bigger bookends where this whole uh, sermon, these three chapters which are so extensive in truth from Jesus, all encapsulate this idea of what does it look like to live in the kingdom of heaven and to enter into the kingdom of heaven. What is it that Jesus is bringing? Because he starts this ministry, he's bringing the good news of the kingdom, and it's kind of like, well, time out. What does that even mean? What is the kingdom? And so this is where Jesus begins. He's like, let me explain to you what this looks like. How, this, uh, how the kingdom impacts our lives and our understanding and how it should change how we see the world around us. And that's where we enter into verse 6, right? It's the kingdom of God. What impact is it having in my understanding of who God is and how I'm going to live my life personally? But beyond that, how should it impact the world around me? And why does this matter and why is it important? And so Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Well, blessed, right? The Greek word makarios It's a state of existence in relationship to God in which a person is blessed from God's perspective even when he or she doesn't feel happy or isn't currently experiencing good fortune. Because we often say blessed, and and some of you would recognize, right, we went through this whole time period of hashtag blessed on social media, and really all that was was people being like, look at how good my life is. Things are working out really well for me, so I must be blessed. Blessed. Well, if that's what the definition of blessed is, then what Jesus is saying makes no sense to any of this. Because encapsulated in the Beatitudes is actually this counter-cultural worldview of what it means to be blessed. Right? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Our world wouldn't say that. Not many of those people that are putting that hashtag on their social media were like, didn't have food today, look how blessed I am. That wasn't their intention and their focus because usually we'd say that's not blessed. Because we misinterpret what that word means it's not my life looks great and everything is going well and things are moving in the right direction in my mind and so i'm blessed but negative feelings absence of feelings or adverse conditions cannot take away the blessedness of those who exist in relationship with god we are blessed because we get to be with him because he is our joy and our salvation regardless of our circumstances in life So when he says blessed in all these beatitudes, he's not saying this idea life is going to be easy and good. But instead it's contrary, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, that's not something the world would say is blessed. Blessed are those who mourn. How am I blessed when I'm mourning from a worldly perspective? Blessed are the humble. Well, they don't go very far in this world. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. The peacemakers. Those who are persecuted. You're like, oh, Jesus is giving a message that's very different than what the world would say. This idea of blessing then can't be one of my life is good and things are easy or things are going how the world says they should go, but it has to have that deeper understanding of it. What does it mean to be blessed? Well, according to scripture, to be blessed means we have Jesus. We live in the hope and security of what he's done and who he is. That is what blessed means. And so when we read this, Uh, I know we're going over that really fast, but when we read this, we have to see it with that perspective. Why am I blessed? Not because everything is great, but because I can rest in the one who is in control. And because he is the one who is at work in bringing these things to pass. So that's the first part, blessed. But blessed are those who hunger and thirst. That's a hard one. Right? That is kind of hard. Like, okay, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. What does this mean and look like? So that's my question for you. All right? I remembered from last time I was here, because last time I completely forgot. Um, but this time I remembered when I first talked to him. I was like, yes, we do some questions here. So I'm going to try and do this. I'm not saying it'll be as good as it normally is. I'm, I'm learning and figuring out what it looks like for you guys. But this is my first question. And by first question, I mean multiple questions together lumped in that you guys can talk about in your tables for a couple minutes. And it's, what does it mean to hunger and thirst? Have you experienced these things to a high degree, being hungry and thirsty? How did you feel? And then also, how did it feel to eat or drink afterward? 
All right, that is my question for you to just talk about a little. Maybe you have a little story that you want to share that you can express with one another of this memory because it will help us to get into mindset of what is this like? What is that experience? What does this feel like? So talk together. I'll just give you a few minutes and then we'll keep going. I'm sure there's lots of stories you could share and we would have a good time, but to, to manage that well, we're gonna keep going. But probably all of us have an idea of this, right? We talk about these terms even, and maybe I'm just extreme because I love food, uh, but right where it's like, I'm just so hungry, I'm gonna die, right? Like this idea, I just feel so hungry, I just I long to eat something. It's like, yeah, it's been like three hours, right? That's a really long time. I'm hungry and thirsty. Uh, but for me, a story that really makes sense, my wife was reminding me of this on the way here, but uh, I've got to go to a few places around the world and, and do some level of missions. And the first time I went to Sierra Leone in West Africa, we were on a team and we brought all our own food, uh, which isn't a bad thing in and of itself, except that I eat a lot of food, a lot of food, and I enjoy that. And so we're there, we're going all day, every day, and we're like on rations. And I remember that was the first time in my life where I was like, I'm just always hungry. I would finish eating a meal and I'm like, I'm still hungry immediately after. And that was just the reality of my time there. And I was like so excited to just eat food till I was full. Now, obviously we need to be wise and, and those are things I had to learn. I was 18 years old and I'm like, wow, I was just so hungry all the time. And as part of that trip, after we finished, uh, we went to London for a few days just to debrief together as a team. Now, something about this team is that there was 28 girls and three guys and it's just how it worked out in the numbers and um, that put somewhat of an onus on us as guys when we were there without going into all the details but the girls wanted to say thank you uh, for our time there and so when we're in London they like made this big meal for us and I ate until I was full and until I was more than full and felt disgusting right you get anyone experienced that 
Yeah, that used to be like my whole life, right? Every time Thanksgiving where you're just like, I just need to lie down on the couch. I'm like, that's not a good, that's not a good thing. But I just ate so much and I was just so uncomfortable afterwards. But I was longing for something because I'd been hungering and thirsting for that month that we had been there. Not that I was like wasting away or something, but that I was like, man, I'm hungry. And so I'm going to eat everything in hopes that it will satisfy me. And what was the twofold result? One, I felt disgusting because that's not what I needed. And two, how long do you think it was after that till I was hungry again? Right? It didn't actually satisfy me. And that's this hunger and thirst that we see throughout Scripture is there's this deep call in the Word of God. We need to hunger and thirst for righteousness. We need to hunger and thirst for God and to be with Him. For those of you that... Remember the maybe more old school, like 90s style songs that we don't sing all the time, but as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. This desire in scripture of God, does my heart long for you? Because that's what hunger and thirst draws out. Is that what you heard around your table, right? There's this desire. It expresses this desire that we have, this longing for something that is going to satisfy us. I'm hungry. I, what's going to satisfy me? I get a craving, what's going to satisfy me? Some of you that went through pregnancy, you might understand that to a whole other level, right? These cravings, and like, this is what's going to satisfy. And it's not that food in itself is inherently bad, and it's like, well, that's never going to satisfy, but there is this underpinning of all this in Scripture of what is the longing of our heart? What is it that we are hoping for and, and desiring? And we see this in Scripture we see the sons of Korah that wrote some of the Psalms in Psalm 42, verse 2, and, and 63, verse 1, enter into this. So I want to read one of those. We're just going to read one for time's sake, but 42, verse 2 in Psalms. And it says, oh, you know, when you're one page away and then you accidentally flip five because they're all like right together. <laughs> Perfect. Very much so. And it says, I thirst for God, the living God. When, when I come, when can I come and appear before him? I thirst for God. I long for him. And we see in Amos chapter 8 as well, this deep longing in him. And there's this deep famine against the word of God where this becomes God's point where he's speaking to his people. And he's like, because you won't listen, you think famine of food is bad. He's like, I'm going to give you a famine of the word of God. And you're going to experience hunger and thirst like you've never experienced it before. This deep longing in their life where God is like, I will bring you in my discipline back. Because that's why he's going to give them that. But he sees this longing in our heart. Or as Ecclesiastes talks about it, God has set eternity in our hearts. We long for him. We long for something that is greater than what is in front of us that will satisfy because we hunger and thirst. We realize that this world is not as it was meant to be. We long for these things. And often this is called this this experienced longing that we have in our life. Augustine, he's a great um, early church father, talks about it like this. He says, there is on the one hand the pained longing for the transcendent, and on the other the sense of inadequacy of merely earthly goods to satisfy that longing. Where we see in our hearts, man, there is this longing for something. I am hungering and thirsting. All of us are. This isn't just for those who follow Jesus that Jesus was talking to, but there is this hunger and thirst that we experience as human beings. God, I long for something in my life to fill me, to make me feel satisfied. That emptiness that's in my heart, or as Pascal talked about it, this God-shaped vacuum in my life, where what's going to fill this? There must be something that will satisfy me. There has to be something. And again, Augustine says, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Because there's nothing else that can satisfy. There's nothing else that will give us what we want. And so Pascal called it um, this deposed royalty. That's how he expressed it. And as part of this is that people discern in themselves a wretchedness that cannot be cured and a death that they cannot escape. Unless people find solace in God, they will divert themselves from these realities to avoid despair. So we feel this hunger and thirst, but we say, maybe I can satisfy it in this, and this, and this, and this. And we try to fulfill what can only be fulfilled by the greatest with these things that are lesser. 
we let that be what drives and motivates us. That we think, man, there must be something more, something greater. And so Pascal, Pascal said this. I know I'm quoting a bunch here, but they just say such good things. He says, what else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once in man a true happiness, of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in those that are, though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object, in other words, God himself. Nothing else can fill this longing And yet we seek to fill it with other things all of the time. We are born with desires in our life. And why would we be born with these desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists? If I find myself, in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, That does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly desires were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing, to look for something greater. And so Jesus says, are you hungry and thirsty? Because the answer is yes. No matter where we are in our understanding of who God is, every person on this earth is hungry and thirsty for something more. Why do you think we ask the questions, well, what is the purpose of life? What am I going to do with my life? How can I be happy? How can I find joy and satisfaction? How can, how can, how can, what is? Right? We ask these questions because there is an innate desire for us. We're longing for something. A longing for which we seek satisfaction and yet struggle with where to search for it. This leads us often to hunger and thirst for sin, for temporary fulfillment. We desire and so we consume but not all things can actually satisfy. In fact, only one thing can actually satisfy us. And this is what Jesus is saying. When you hunger and thirst, do it for righteousness. Not for sin, not for temporary pleasures that will make you feel good for a moment, but will end up leaving you empty. Because if you're like me, you've searched for those things, right? I've looked for satisfaction in many things, and I still do in my sinfulness. Just because I know Jesus doesn't mean that my flesh is... Uh, has no sway in my life. I hate it, but it does. But the reality is that God has created us for something more. And we will only be satisfied if we look beyond that because any sin that I tried to satisfy made it made me feel satisfied for a moment, right? And doesn't it get us? Man, it catches us so hard because we do something and we're like, man, that feels so good. That fulfilled some kind of longing in my heart for something. For that moment I ate and I felt satisfied. But then all of a sudden, the next day, I felt hungry again. So I'm like, I guess I need more of this. And I participate more in my sin because I'm looking for something greater than me that will satisfy the emptiness that I have. That will satisfy this longing and desire. And yet every time it leaves me empty and so I search for it more, I look for it more, and each time I feel emptier on the other end of it. Right? Isn't that what it does? We feel that. We know that. It's all of us as human beings experience this. I'm looking for something and I can't find it, so I try to fill it with whatever I can find. And we leave empty. I'm still hungry. I'm still thirsty. There has to be something more, doesn't there? We see this expressed even in people like Tom Brady. He did a 60 Minutes interview. This is a number of years ago, but there's a moment in there where Tom, they talk about everything he has, right? Man, you have the perfect life. You're a champion. You're rich. You have everything that the world would want. You're married. Like, all these things going on from every worldly perspective. It's like you have all this stuff. And he says, then why do I feel like there's got to be something more than this? This world doesn't satisfy. We try to convince ourselves that it will if we just get enough of it. But Jesus says there's something else you need to hunger and thirst for. He has something better. Isn't that a joy? And so there's this element of hunger and thirst for righteousness that we get. But we also see it in the world around us. And this is an important piece of this. It, Jesus isn't just talking about individuals in this verse of the Beatitudes. He's talking about the kingdom, right? He's talking about the world as a whole even. There's something greater. So it's not just me 
and my hunger and thirst. But we, as followers of Jesus, if you know him, we also have this responsibility, joyful responsibility, for the world to see this hunger and thirst that they have. Right? It's this idea that if you don't know you're sick, why do you think you need a doctor? The world needs to understand this, and so we long to serve God by helping the world to see the extent of who they are in their brokenness. Now, not putting it in their face and that kind of thing, but helping them to understand better. Man, there is brokenness. There is a longing that we have, but there's also satisfaction for that longing. And so we should experience a passionate concern for the right things in kingdom living. We should long to glorify God with how we act, how we think, what we pursue, how we live, but we need, our under, we need to understand our desperate need for it not to be our own efforts. Because what I bring to the table will never satisfy. It will leave me hungry and thirsty. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's about daily surrender and realizing that our strength is minuscule, but that all uh, the more I will revel in my weakness, for in my weakness we see the power of God perfected. Right? 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9. Paul's like, I will revel all the more in my weakness, for in my weakness I see the strength of God perfected in him, because it's not about me. I can't satisfy. I will never be able to satisfy for someone else, and certainly I can't find satisfaction for myself, I know, because I've tried it in so many ways, but only Jesus will. But what are we supposed to hunger and thirst for then? Not sin, not empty things that will leave us wanting more, but righteousness. And that's another important question. And we're going to spend a minute at your tables talking about it. And the question is, what is righteousness? Is there a simple definition? Have you pondered this before? How do I seek it? How do I earn it? What can I do? Can I do anything? Just talk about that really quick around your tables. What is righteousness? Now that you've answered that, we'll move on, right? We don't need to talk about righteousness anymore. Uh, it's a big concept, and it's hard, and I'm, I'm sure uh, you guys had incredible talk with one another, and we're going to explore this word legitimately really quickly for how deep it is uh, and how wide the understanding of it is. So we're first introduced to righteousness and righteous in the Old Testament. We see many places where righteousness is claimed by people through their actions. So places like Psalm 119, verse 121, and 17, verse 1 show this. They're like, God, hear me in my righteousness. There's this claim of righteousness as they come before God and say, look, I've been righteous, so hear what I have to say. 
And that makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable, doesn't it? Or at least some of us, I'm like, that makes me feel uncomfortable. I would not want to say that. I feel like it's way too bold for me to say anything about righteousness because I know the wickedness of my heart. So I'd be like, how are these psalmists saying that they're righteous? They are so bold. I feel more like Psalm 143, verse 2, where it's like, there is no one who is righteous. No, not one. I'm like, that I get. Because I feel like that's me. And so I understand that peace, and there's kind of this tension. Not a tension that's unsolvable by any means, but where there's like, are we righteous or are we not righteous? What does that mean and look like? And so the Old Testament meaning helps us with that. The root of the word means justice or injustice. And there's an underlying idea of one of a conformity to a norm. So this doesn't mean that righteousness is relativistic, because in the Old Testament usage of the word, people are righteous uh, when their personal and interpersonal behavior accords with an established moral or ethical norm, which in the Bible is God's revealed will to his people. So as God reveals his will to his people, those who are righteous and would claim those things are saying, God, I have followed your law. Because the law is the ultimate revelation of the will of God. It, in and of itself, the law is a reflection of the very character and nature of God. It's perfect. It's pleasing. That's why Psalm 119, right, the longest chapter in the Bible, it just goes on and on about how incredible the law is. Because it's a reflection of the character and nature of God. And so people, if they were following the law of God, could say, God, I'm righteous before you. I haven't murdered, I haven't committed adultery, I haven't been doing those things, and so I am righteous because there was kind of this justice, injustice. Am I following what I've been told to do or not do? And that's where this connotation of a righteous person, and even Abraham believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness because he was following God and what he had given us. But whenever righteous was used in the Old Testament, there was no suggestion of sinlessness. It was not implying that because they could say, I'm righteous before God, this person was somehow perfect. That's not what it meant, but it implies action and harmony with their obligation in their relationship with God. They were doing the things that God had told them to do. They were following him. And throughout scripture, we certainly see God as righteous. Over and over again, he is expressed as the righteous one. His actions are always righteous. Um... Because all God does and is, is in harmony with his character. He is the moral judge of the universe. And the very character of God is the ultimate standard of righteousness. And so as God is love, God is righteous. That's just who he is. It's part of his very character and nature. Because he's always going to be in accordance with his will. And his will is the perfect one that is our moral standard for humanity. And so we see this again expressed in the law. We see the declaration of Moses in Deuteronomy 4, verse 8, where he's like, follow this and you will be righteous, essentially. Follow these things that God has said. And we see God expressing his righteousness in two different ways in the Old Testament. And first, um, so through his actions in two different ways. The first is in his judgment. God hates wickedness since he is morally perfect. And so he becomes the only possible perfectly moral judge. This makes God's act of judgment expressions of his intrinsic righteousness. And so we understand his righteousness because he's perfect and set apart. And then the second is that God is Savior. Isaiah 45 verse 21 makes this incredibly clear where it's like, God, you are righteous and you will save us through your righteousness. And so there's this building in the Old Testament of our understanding of this. I can be righteous in the sense that I follow what God says, and yet I'm still completely set apart from God. And we read places like Isaiah 64, and it says, all my righteous acts are like filthy rags before God. And so there's this tension coming, and it's like, well, what does this mean and look like? And so in Isaiah, God promised, he says, I'm going to send a truly righteous one that's going to come, and he is going to deliver you. And this is what we call imputing in the New Testament, when Jesus came and he died on the cross, we believe in him, and it says he imputes his righteousness to us. Because our righteousness is not enough. I can try to follow the law, and Jesus makes it very clear in the rest of Matthew chapter 5 that I will fail. Right? He's like, oh, you've heard don't murder someone. He's like, yeah, that's like the really, really obvious expression of that law. Do you want to hear the heart behind it? If you hate someone, you've already murdered them. And you're like, oh, I guess I'm not very righteous. Don't commit adultery in your heart. Like, easy. 
right? That's what they were saying, basically. The Pharisees are like, I would never commit adultery. I've never done that in my life. And he's like, well, if you look at someone with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery, right? And it just goes down this list where Jesus is like, you've heard it said this, and you think you're righteous. Well, let me show you the reality. Even though you've done righteous acts because you've tried to follow the law of God, and that's not a bad thing, he's like, you need to see the true propensity of your heart. And to seek righteousness, as we see um, coming out in the New Testament so clearly, is this idea that how do we seek righteousness? Well, we seek Jesus. Nothing else can do that. And we see that clearly laid out in 5 verse 20 in Matthew. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Do you know what big hit that was to them? Because legitimately in the Jewish culture, the Pharisees were like perfect. They followed the law so stringently, and not only that, but all these other like oral traditions that have been made up that weren't in the law itself, and they followed it all to the T. So from a human perspective, Pharisees, perfectly righteous, right? They're not doing anything wrong, and we see Paul even say that later in his life. He's like, right? He's like, I never broke the law. He's like, I was very stingy in not breaking the law, and yet Paul realized that his righteousness was filthy rags before God. But for the people hearing this, when Jesus is like, man, your righteousness has surpassed that of the Pharisees, they're like, what? This is impossible. It is impossible. On our own. And this is what Jesus is trying to get at. He's like, you hunger and thirst. You long for something. And what that needs to be is Jesus. The longing of our hearts has to be him because we cannot do it. We are hopeless, we are helpless, we are unable in every single capacity. I don't say this to make you feel sad today. I don't, make this, I don't say this to make you feel hopeless, but I do say this to help us remember, I am broken. I am sinful on my own. But Jesus, the greatest words in the Bible, right? But God demonstrates his love to us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But God steps in. And so when we hunger and thirst, it needs to be for him, first and foremost. And then out of that, flowing out of this longing for him, is we enter into this desire in that to then seek to live a life that would be pleasing to him, to love our neighbors as ourselves, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, souls, mind, and strength, to give everything that we have to him for his glory, to use us how he would want us to be used. It's joy. It's incredible. But it comes first to that understanding, man, I'm hungry and thirsty, but what am I trying to satisfy that with? Where am I looking to to fill me? And that's the last thing that Jesus says and that we're going to talk about really quick, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who hunger and thirst for what Jesus gives us, what he's offered us. Why? Because we will be filled. What a glorious outcome. Jesus does not say that you may be filled, or that you'll be filled for a day, right? Me laying on the ground, feeling so full, and then being hungry later. It's like, that's not the kind of fullness that Jesus is talking about. We will no longer be longing for things with no satisfaction, but we will be satisfied. Doesn't that sound amazing? Doesn't that just resonate in our hearts? Like, God, that's what I want. But we got to stop looking for it in ourselves we got to stop looking for it in a world of broken things or trying to fulfill it in our own. He just says, look, if you rest in me, then you will be satisfied. If we move and shift our perspective, I'm going to hunger and thirst for Jesus alone. He's going to be the, the, where I focus my eyes, right? The author and perfecter of my faith. Then I will be filled. And this fits into what we call the already not yet. This filling will be experienced now by all who believe in Jesus because he dwells in us, as Galatians 2.20 tells us. And we become a temple of God, like in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. But we also await a future day where we will see this in its fullness, where we will be filled with righteousness as we can't even dream about right now. And we live as one blessed in this world, full of joy because of what Christ has done, and also as one who looks forward to what it will be like in heaven with our Savior. And so we see this, Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Psalm 16, verse 11. You make known to me the path of life in your presence. There is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
In John 4, verse 13 and 14, Jesus said, Everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. He's talking about water from a well. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. He will satisfy. In fact, the water I give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. And then again, Matthew 5, verse 20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. We will be filled, not because I do enough, not because I'm great enough. Anything I accomplish in my strength or ability will only leave me thirsty and hungry, but Jesus came to offer satisfaction and fullness. We can be satisfied and righteous because of Jesus. He's the propitiation for our sin, meaning he satisfies the wrath of God on our behalf. And he imputes or he gives us his righteousness uh, in place of our own filthy rags. This is very different than what our flesh tells us. Right? It's very different than how the world lives But the Beatitudes give this upside-down perspective of the world. If you want to be filled, then hunger and thirst for the right thing. So we hunger and thirst, right? All of us do. With what are we going to try and satisfy that desire? That's what I want us to think about as we go. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Ah, Your word is beautiful. It is joy and satisfaction in our life. Thank you, Lord God, that you... Um, do not leave us in this emptiness of longing in our hearts, but that you have provided satisfaction for us in Jesus. You saw us in our desperate state, and you came for us. And what joy that is, Father God. Help us to live in the joy of that satisfaction and that salvation. Help us to not lean on ourselves, on our own understanding, but to trust in you and know that you, Lord God, in your kindness, died so that we could have life, so that we could be satisfied. And Father, I do pray that you will help each of us as we struggle with uh, searching after other things to bring us fullness, that we will see the error of our way and um, rest in your kindness. Pray this in your name. Amen.